Eleanor was born and raised in Salem, Massachusetts, and those of us who know and love her still recognize her Massachusetts accent. <laughs> Shortly after receiving a BS degree from Simmons College, she came to Oberlin to become the children's librarian. For 43 years, Eleanor inspired children first to listen to good literature and later to read for their own enjoyment. Since her retirement in 1988, Eleanor has kept busy as a volunteer tour guide for the Oberlin community and the Lorain County Visitors Bureau. She also enjoys sharing her vast knowledge of Oberlin history through programs such as we are having tonight. I am honored to present Eleanor Owen, who will speak on Adelia Field Johnston, college and community activist. Eleanor. Thank you, Pat, for that very nice introduction. It prompts me to say that the announcements of your meeting this evening that describe the speaker as a noted historian were flattering, of course, but I know better, and so do many of you, not <laughs> least of all Roland Bauman. <laughs> Truth to tell, I am less an historian than what I think I may call an Oberlin antique. <laughs> I am rapidly moving toward that point in time when I too shall be a part of Oberlin's history. <laughs> be that as it may, I have been asked to speak tonight about Adelia Antoinette Field Johnston. And I am happy to do so particularly because we have in the audience Mildred Haynes, whose life was touched when she was a young child in a classroom in Oberlin by Adelia Johnston. She remembers her vividly as a woman of great precision and dignity, and she left a lasting impression on Mrs. Haynes. Adelia Johnston was an Oberlinian whose services to the college and community were significant in her own day and still affect us in many ways. My interest in her life was first piqued by a slender red paper-bound volume that was published in the mid-1980s, a pamphlet, as it were, entitled The Swamp that was different, a brief history of Oberlin land use. It focuses on the founding of Oberlin and the development of Tappan Square, the Arboretum, the Plum Creek area, and the Industrial Park touching with appreciation on individuals who over the years have attributed to the preservation and improvement of such areas as these. Among those who are mentioned in the pamphlet is Mrs. Johnston. With my curiosity aroused to find her name among those of such well-known Oberlinians as Charles Martin Hall and the late Bill Long, I was prompted to read her biography, a book written by Harriet Keeler, a younger contemporary and an Oberlin graduate. Published in 1912 and called The Life of Adelia A. Field Johnston, it has a long subtitle that provides us with at least a partial glimpse of the stature of its subject. It speaks of Mrs. Johnston as a woman who served Oberlin College for 37 years in the positions of principal of the women's department, dean of women, instructor and professor of medieval history, lecturer on the history of painting and architecture, trustee and member of the Prudential Committee. Mrs. Johnston has said that by the time she was seven, she was studying Brown's grammar could outline on the floor all of the world's important countries, could read aloud the weekly paper, and could name the trees and plants of the woods as readily as the objects in her own home. <laughs> 
Sundays were spent in the community church, where between long sermons, neighbors gathered to discuss the events of the day while they enjoyed their basket dinners. Mrs. Johnston reports that women took an interested part in these discussions, possibly providing her with the sense of confidence that she felt in later years to shape her own thoughts and to speak in public. In addition, political discussions in Adelia's home as a child made her an ardent abolitionist, like her parents, long before she came to Oberlin. A number of events marked her early years, when she was six, a move from her log home to a new framed house, when she was eight, the birth of a younger sister, when she was 10, a move from Lafayette to Chester in Jaga County, enabling her to attend a fine academy. And two years later, when she was 12, the death of her father and a sudden move to Clarksfield to live with her mother's brothers. Here she attended the village school and for a short time, when the teacher was stricken with measles, at the age of 13, she herself served as teacher. It was at this time that Adelia's mother, dissatisfied with the village school, made a decision that was to change forever the life of her older daughter. She decided to return to Chester, and with her household goods gathered into a farm wagon, she began the slow three-day journey to her former home but we are told the roads were poor, the mud was deep, and the horses were too exhausted to reach Illyria where the family had planned to spend the night. They stopped instead in Oberlin. And here Mrs. Field decided that Oberlin could properly educate her daughters. Within a short time, she had bought a comfortable home, taken up residence, and taken in boarders. Two years later, at the age of 15, Adelia enrolled in the ladies' course at the college, graduating in 1856 at the age of only 19. Frances Hosford has described her as she looked at the time. Slender in her white graduating frock, with masses of curling hair of artist red, with the beautiful dark eyes that sometimes go with such Titian hair and the rose leaf complexion that nature adds when she is in a lavish mood. If her features were strong and her face was sober in repose, her smile was quick. Her face was animated in conversation and she spoke with a dramatic flair. Later in life, her lectures were called a marvel of clarity and brilliance and she was popular both as a professor and a hostess. Three events that were to affect her life in a lasting way marked Adelia's college years. The first was a deep commitment to religion and a profound belief in the immediate and loving presence of God, a commitment that grew out of her great respect and affection for Charles Grandison Finney president of the college and pastor at First Church. Later in life, when Adelia returned to Oberlin to serve as principal of the women's department and to teach, Finney became her mentor, guide, and friend. And as long as he lived, there was always a place at the table for Adelia. The second influence of her college years was her abiding disappointment that she had been persuaded by her mother and by Mary Ann Dascom, then the principal of the women's department, to enroll in the ladies' course rather than the more demanding classical course pursued by men. She once said to her biographer, if I had known what I was to do in life, I should never have consented to be overruled in the matter of my education. In 1870, when she returned to Oberlin to succeed Mrs. Dascom, 
She was determined that women students in the future should be given the opportunity for a rigorous and equal education. She felt that the work of Oberlin for womankind was still unfinished, and she set herself the task of helping her college to develop the noble, its noble beginnings into full realization. In this facet of her life, as Frances Hospit has said, her story is one of far vision and long patience. <coughs> A third event occurred at Oberlin that was to change her name from that of Field to Johnston. She met and gave her promise of marriage to James M. Johnston a graduate of 1858, and like herself, a teacher. Following her earlier graduation in 1856, she had taught for three years at Mossy Creek in Tennessee. Nat Brandt tells us in The Town That Started the Civil War that during this period, Adelia returned to Ohio to visit her mother, then living in Rochester and she found herself with her mother in the Oberlin bookstore of James Fitch when news was brought in of the capture, arrest, and proposed rescue of John Price, the 19-year-old fugitive slave. Nat Brandt writes, Adelia, with her mother, immediately went out, got into their buggy, and joined the now veritable crush of people heading for Wellington. I think this says something memorable about the daring do of the young red-headed Adelia Field. In 1859, after a long correspondence, Adelia and Mr. Johnston were married in Rochester on August 17th in her mother's home. During the following year, they moved to Orwell, he to serve as principal of the Orwell Academy, and she to assist him. He to begin his studies for a second degree, and she to begin the study of Greek. But tragically, their plans and their happiness were cut short. With the outbreak of war in 1861, they felt they could no longer continue to teach at a time when their country was engaged in a struggle for its life. For this reason, they resigned their positions in Orwell, he intending to become a soldier and she a nurse. But in January 1862, stricken by an illness of only two weeks, Adelia's husband died, and a widow at the age of only 25, she faced a life alone. What would the young Mrs. Johnston do? It is characteristic of Adelia that in spite of her very deep grief, she set herself three goals, to continue her studies, to observe the best teaching methods of her day, and to broaden her knowledge of the world. Because there were then no graduate schools for women to attend, Adelia returned to teaching, moving to Kinsman, Ohio, to act as principal of the Kinsman Academy. There, a lifelong friendship developed between Adelia and Dr. Dudley Allen, a community physician and chairman of the Academy Trustees. It is interesting to note that it was largely through a suggestion of Mrs. Johnston that Dr. Allen later moved to Oberlin. And here, his young son, was to become the renowned and wealthy Dr. Dudley Peter Allen, grew up in the family home on South Professor Street, now called Allen Croft. To Dr. Allen and his wife, as you know, Oberlin today is indebted for both its hospital and museum. Harry Akila tells us in her biography of Mrs. Johnston that one incident at Kinsman still survives the drift of years. A great interest had arisen in the temperance movement, and Mrs. Johnston was an active participant. She was as well an important influence on her students. Together, they signed a pledge to refrain from the use of wine, a pledge 
that for Adelia became a continuing standard of conduct. Only once, in 1869, when she was en route to Europe by ship, did the pledge become a burden. The story is set down in her diary. It adds a touch of humor. She writes, March 31st, sick. April 1st, sick. Urged to drink wine. April 2nd, sick. Nothing is endurable except ice water, and they all say I must not drink it, but this terrible thirst. April 3rd, sick. I do long for some of the wine which is so constantly offered me. <laughs> I am so weak that I can but just get upon deck, but my pledge to the Kinsman School must not be broken. April 4th, in the forenoon, ate a little, the first since Tuesday. April 5th, still better, up at an early hour upon deck, went to the table at noon, only one other lady present. My temperance principles have triumphed. Ice water is better than wine. <laughs> Here writes Harriet Keeler his testimony to the faithful steadiness of purpose and devotion to principle that were always a mark of Mrs. Johnston. Notwithstanding her later travels throughout the world and the social life that was thrust upon her, she kept her pledge. And she was one of the dedicated citizens of Oberlin who kept the city for many years untouched by saloons. As the war came to a close, Mrs. Johnston left Kinsman for Andover, Massachusetts, where at Phillips Academy, she began the study of Latin with a Dr. Samuel Taylor, one of the most gifted teachers of his day. At the same time, she broadened her knowledge of the world in Boston, where for the first time she saw the ocean and ships, rode out to Bunker Hill, visited a publishing house, enjoyed concerts and museums, and attended parties at which there was dancing and wine was served. <laughs> I did not touch the wine, she writes. <laughs> Following the year in Massachusetts, Mrs. Johnston accepted a position as a teacher of Latin and history at the Academy in North Situate in Rhode Island that her forebears had helped to settle. In 1868, inheriting land from her husband's estate that she then sold, she found that she was at last able to afford the travel that she had for so long wanted to do. She journeyed first to Michigan to see her mother, and then in the spring of 1869, she left for New York, stopping briefly in Oberlin, where she was entertained by Dr. Allen, Mary Ann Dascom, and President Fairchild. In April, she sailed from New York for Hamburg, Germany. This was the first of many trips that she was to make in the years to come, not only to the other countries of Europe, but to Nassau, the Near East, and Egypt as well. And it was typical of the journeys that were to follow. Mrs. Johnston visited museums, cathedrals, castles, historic battlefields, botanical gardens and zoos, libraries, kindergartens and universities, soup kitchens for the poor, and homes and monuments of the great. She learned to speak both German and French. She moved from one important city to another on the continent and in Great Britain. At the end of a year, she sailed for New York and returned to Oberlin to attend its commencement, then held in August. It was a significant return, <clears throat> for it was during this visit in the summer of 1870 that she was offered and agreed to accept the position of principal of the women's department. She was not asked to teach, but for her teaching was a necessity and she felt it would serve as a corrective to the narrowing tendencies of administration. 
She said she would be happy to serve as principal, but would do so only if she could teach. Her friends attempted to dissuade her from her view, but her wish was granted by the college. When she began to work, she was at the age of 33, the youngest member of the faculty. When she retired at the age of 70, her name was listed first in the college catalog beneath that of the president as the longest tenured professor at Oberlin. Not surprisingly, the classes that Mrs. Johnston was first asked to teach were a part of the ladies' course curriculum. It was unthinkable then that a woman should teach young men. But the unexpected soon occurred. So popular was a fourth year ladies' class assigned to Mrs. Johnston that young men asked to be enrolled. Their request was granted and the class became an elective in the classical course. The young instructor had taken her first step toward an equal education for men and women. The second quickly followed. When a professor of botany was given a leave of absence, President James Fairchild at a meeting of the faculty asked each professor in turn to teach the course in the coming year. Each in turn, each in turn declined. And at last, the president put the question to Mrs. Johnston. We are told that she replied quietly, if it is so desired, I will teach the course. Although she has said that at the time of her response, she knew the Latin name of only one plant, thoroughwort, her childhood knowledge of the woods and fields, her quick mind, and her enthusiasm in the classroom made the course a recognized success. And so for the first time, a required course in the classical curriculum was taught by a woman, and another victory had been gained for Mrs. Johnston's college. If Adelia Johnston proved to be a dedicated and popular teacher, she proved as well to be a conscientious and effective administrator. As principal, it was her duty to introduce the young ladies in her care to the social graces and proper deportment of the day. It was also her responsibility to address them each fortnight on some subject that would promote their cultural well-being. Attendance at the lectures, known in college parlance as general exercises or general X, was required. And Mrs. Johnston did her best to keep her talks lively for her captive audience. One anecdote set down in her biography will serve to make the point. Harriet Keeler writes that Mrs. Johnston, whose carriage was always correct, was frequently disturbed by the shambling gait of some of her charges. She decided one day upon an object lesson that she hoped they would not forget. Her audience had assembled for one of her twice a month lectures, and she appeared as usual. And then, in a most defiant manner, she strode across the platform to her place. The audience was stunned. She disappeared to come a second time, slinking to her place. The audience began to comprehend. She disappeared again to come a third time with every joint apparently unstrung. <laughs> the audience burst into uproarious applause. The fourth time, she crossed the platform with her own incomparable grace and dignity, took her place, and without a word as to what had gone before, held her audience spellbound by the narration of some of her experiences of travel. Perhaps it is true, as Francis Hospit once said, that Oberlin College deprived the stage of two magnificent actors, Adelia Field Johnston and Charles Grandison Finney. They acted no part in which they did not believe, but they were superb in their rendering of what they felt to be the truth. Mrs. Johnston, Johnston apparently possessed a genius for friendship. 
and on more than one occasion, she was responsible for major gifts to the college that made possible the replacement of earlier facilities with newer and more adequate buildings. During her years as an administrator and teacher, her efforts at fundraising and the generosity of such close friends as Dr. and Mrs. Lucian Warner brought into being a number of buildings. Among these, Sturgis Hall, Baldwin Cottage, Talcott Hall, Lord Cottage, and Warner Hall to become the Conservatory of Music. Mrs. Johnston was not only an advocate of the building that was to become Sturgis Hall as a home for the Ladies Literary Societies, but one day she was made aware of the need for a shelter for the families of missionaries returning to Oberlin or visiting in Oberlin. Harriet Keeler tells us that the erection of Lord Cottage, now gone, to meet this need came about in a most interesting way. She writes, one evening to a small group of friends gathered in her parlor, <coughs> Mrs. Johnston happened to relate what she had been doing that day. The daughters of a missionary had unexpectedly arrived, serene in the confidence that all that was necessary to do was to arrive in order that doors should fly open and college arrangements make themselves. She has spent the better part of the day trying to find them a boarding place. Every desirable house was full, and she was troubled. Then partly to herself and partly to the others, she went on, we really ought to have a cottage where missionaries and clergymen's daughters and sons can be comfortable and at a house that is not too expensive for them. I really must go out and see if I cannot raise the money for such a building, we ought to have one. The conversation drifted and the matter was for the moment forgotten. The next morning when Mrs. Johnston was alone in her office in Talcott Hall, Mrs. Lord came in and laid a paper before her saying, this is for your missionary children's cottage. As Mrs. Johnston told the story, I unfolded the paper and found to my astonishment a check for $10,000. I remonstrated. I told Mrs. Lord that I could not accept it, that she ought not to give so much. But she quietly said, let me explain. All my life I have been a wage earner, and many years ago I determined that when I had the leisure I would go to Europe. So I began to put money aside for that purpose. and. I have added to it, but never taken from it. It is now fully $10,000. I did not have time to go abroad when I was young, and I know now that I shall never go. And I want you to have the money for your missionary cottage. There was nothing to do, wrote Mrs. Johnston, but to accept it gratefully. If Adelia Johnston proved to be a dedicated and popular teacher, as I have said, she was also an able administrator, and here is evidence of that fact. As the student body at Oberlin grew and women students increased in numbers, new dormitories were needed to house the girls in Mrs. Johnston's care. And in 1887, Baldwin Cottage was opened in the spring and Talcott Hall in the fall the first at the request of the major donor, Mr. Baldwin of Cleveland, to provide an apartment for Mrs. Johnston. Again, the story of how Baldwin Cottage came into being is worth our hearing. Mrs. Johnston has written, we had only a few thousand dollars and I felt anxious. So I went into Cleveland and called upon Mr. Baldwin at his place of business. I did not mean to ask him for anything, but just to tell the situation. I thought he might give something, perhaps a thousand dollars. He listened carefully to my story and said he had long been thinking of doing something for Oberlin. And without saying how much, he quietly wrote a check and handed it to me. When I saw how much it was, I was dazed. I had no words to thank him properly. 
I made my way to the home of my friends, Mr. and Mrs. Solon Severance, and there, Madam Severance promised $800 for the furnishings. I never expect to be so happy again. Mr. Baldwin had written a check for $20,000. Harriet Keeler continues the story. After the knowledge of this gift became common property in Cleveland, a friend rather chided Mr. Baldwin for giving so much to Oberlin when Cleveland had so many needs. Mr. Baldwin urged in extenuation of his conduct that he had investigated and found that Oberlin gave more educationally for a dollar than any other school. And besides, he said, while his eyes twinkled, you know, Mrs. Baldwin and I think a great deal of Mrs. Johnston. Apparently, Adelia Johnston was a woman not only of strong principle, but also of great charisma. It would be impossible in a brief program to summarize all of the multiple services of Mrs. Johnston to her college. Let me touch on only three of her contributions as evidence of the wide range of her interests and concerns. In 1874, she prepared a report for the college that was published in a book called The Education of American Girls, edited by Anna Brackett. That book and report still stand on the Oberlin College Library shelves. In 1893, she represented the college at the Chicago World's Fair for three weeks, setting aside Monday and Friday afternoons to receive alumni and friends who visited the Oberlin booth in the educational building. During her ongoing travels around the country and abroad, she brought together an extensive collection of excellent photographs of paintings to illustrate her art lectures, lectures that had become a part of the elective curriculum and were in demand in communities around Oberlin. It was this collection that in part stimulated the desire for a college art museum. It is satisfying to know that in her own lifetime, Mrs. Johnston was recognized for the contributions that she made to Oberlin and to the larger world of education. In 1890, she was named a full professor becoming thereby the first woman ever to hold such a rank in a co-educational college. In 1894, her title of principal was changed to that of dean, making her the first woman at Oberlin to carry that title just 100 years ago. Hillsdale College in Michigan in 1873 and Oberlin College in 1878 bestowed upon her the honorary degree of Master of Arts. In 1906, at the culmination of her career, Western Reserve University conferred upon her the degree of LLD. In 1895, the alumni established a Johnson professorship in tribute to her. And in 1901, they elected her to the College Board of Trustees when she found that by state law, she was prohibited from serving as both a trustee and a faculty member, she resigned from her elected position, but was immediately appointed by the college to its prudential committee. In 1900, Mrs. Johnston left her position as dean, but continued to teach for another seven years. Perhaps she sensed that times were changing and a more modern perspective was needed by a 20th century Dean of Women. It may have been this awareness that prompted the affectionate humor of a poem in the High Ohi dedicated to her in 1903. Let me see if I can find a line or two of that to read to you. It is entitled, The Good Old Oberlin. This is a sorrowful story told by our Madam J when she talks with her old time cronies of the Oberlin of today. There go a man and a maiden, together as sure as you live, not a sign of rain in the heavens 
what earthly excuse can they give? <laughs> you may recall that in early Oberlin, men and women were prohibited from crossing campus together, with rare exceptions, one of those being that a gentleman might hold an umbrella for a young lady in a rainstorm. <laughs> Mrs. Johnston continued to teach until 1907, as I have said. And then at the age of 70, returning from Europe, she found, to her surprise, that like other colleagues ranging in age from 65 to 68, she had been retired with a comfortable pension from the newly established Carnegie Foundation. Fortunately for her and for her community, she was now able to devote her time and energies to other concerns. Improvement of the appearance of the village preservation of the Plum Creek area, and development of a walkway there. A few years earlier, distressed by the unkempt look of the back lots of the village stores, she had sought permission of the owners to clean them up at her own expense. Twice or perhaps three times, we are told, her efforts were repeated, until at last the merchants of Oberlin began to care for their own backyards. <laughs> With this success as momentum, Mrs. Johnston then proposed the formation of the Oberlin Village Improvement Society, a forerunner, as you know, of Ohio. The purpose of the society was to educate the public sentiment, to offer prizes for the best kept streets, to agitate for the removal of unsightly fences, to encourage the mowing of lawns, and to work for the protection and care of the Plum Creek area as a future parkland. This, as I noted earlier, was an interest that was to keep Mrs. Johnston absorbed until her death at the age of 73. During the final months of her life, an illness that has been described by her biographer only as that dread disease whose origin is still the great mystery of the medical world, one suspects cancer, twice forced her to undergo surgery, proving only that all surgery was futile. Returning from hospital stays on two occasions in November 1908 and again in February 1910, she appeared to rally. Harriet Keeler writes, she asked her doctors no questions. She suspected the truth, but she had no wish to have her fortune told. She was here on earth to live, and she would live to the end. <coughs> Every moment was precious, and she would use it. She continued her interest in village affairs. She accepted engagements to speak, both in Oberlin and beyond. She went south for a month in May. She attended her last commencement in June, and then, sustained by an indomitable will, only a month away from death, she made her way to the alumni dinner, the baccalaureate, the meeting of the trustees, the alumni meeting, and a meeting of the Ladies Literary Society where she made her last address. Alumni of the society met on her lawn and other older students she received as she sat in a chair on her porch. Four weeks later, she died in Oberlin and today she is buried in Westwood Cemetery, still a part of the community that she had so long served and loved. She was a woman who had made her life count. She has earned our remembrance. Thank you, Eleanor, very much for that marvelous presentation. This concludes OHIO's annual meeting. Thank you all very much for coming.